Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henderson. Uh, it is a great uh, pleasure uh, for me and me to speak on uh, a subject that I, something that I've been doing for the last several uh, years. Uh, I didn't really uh, want to talk only about the, the foundation. I wanted to talk about how we got there. So I'll be talking on uh, a few other uh, areas. Here are my uh, outlines. I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the historical landmarks of mental health research, because that is what led us to do what we've been doing uh, in the area of uh, supporting the youth. I wanted to say a little bit on uh, the subject of the Butajara study on schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and the studies on isolated uh, or uh, special population. Uh, then I will uh, talk a little bit about the Borana uh, Girls Educational Acceleration Program or Acceleration Program for uh, Girls. I have. Uh, Nothing to uh, declare. So there is no any conflict of interest, but I will uh, project a slide where we have acknowledged and then I will still acknowledge a lot of uh, donors, institutions and organizations, universities involved in the research and other uh, academic uh, programs. So I guess by now people know where Ethiopia is because we have been in the news for one or the other reason for a very long time. This is a very ancient uh, nation in the Horn of uh, Africa. Uh, just to help people understand, it's about uh, twice the size of France, or maybe three times the size of Germany. Uh, a population of about uh, 115 uh, million. This is the last year uh, data, even a bit over a year ago. There are over uh, 80 different ethnic groups and uh, as many languages. The annual population growth is really very high. You can imagine you know, how fast the population will double if the change takes place by 2.57% a year. So the economic status is really, the um, economy has not been that good, but uh, definitely year by year, there is significant improvement. According to the World Bank uh, in 2016, about 24% of the population is below the absolute uh, poverty uh, line. Uh, it is also a very uh, traditional uh, society where over 98% of the people uh, are affiliated to one or the other religious group. And this is also a little bit exaggeration. This is only statistics because there are a lot of people who don't belong to this category. Nobody knows uh, their, uh, but these are maybe among the, the believers, not necessarily among the whole uh, population. Right now there are about uh, 112 uh, psychiatrists. The number goes a little bit up and down from time to time. The ratio is about uh, close to one psychiatrist per maybe uh, close to a million uh, population. I wanted to go through landmarks. It doesn't mean, I don't know if this uh, explain uh, things. I wanted to divide into three. The first one is pre-1990. It's a, uh, pre-1990 is really, it's a large chunk of uh, time. But uh, the reason I wanted to say that is there was no uh, significant uh, psychiatric research or any mental health activity during that time. 
So I don't know if things have changed that much even now, but mental health issues were not given any priority. There were only three psychiatrists. Uh, I also wanted uh, to use a general health indicator, uh, which is uh, here I wanted to use a life expectancy pre-1990 was only 47.1, uh, which I have also indicated uh, in the other three, uh, two uh, groups that I wanted to talk about. Between 1990 and 2000, I really don't know if that had a big impact on the changes uh, we had in the country, but uh, there were two things that has happened. There was a World Leaders Organization uh, resolution adopted by member states. So a lot of African countries started to show a little bit of interest to develop or formulate mental health uh, policies, work on programs, action plans, did that matter? Was that really the reason? I'm not really 100% sure, but things started to improve a little bit after 1990. So by 1994, 95, when I joined psychiatry, we had up around 11 psychiatrists. Um, right after that time, there were many programs that had started. So people were interested in mental health researches as they were interested in other uh, subjects. That was also around the time, 1997, when the Bhutajra cohort started. Their life expectancy was a little bit improved. It was 53. After 2000, 2000 to 2020, 21, again, there were many other uh, developments, more uh, collaborations. Uh, especially international collaborations, including the collaboration with uh, the MGH and uh, the Boston University, Dave, uh, Grave, and uh, their team. Uh, so as of recent, life expectancy has really improved compared to what it was. Yes, it has improved significantly. We're now at 67, but still you can see it's really uh, staggering, quite really an improvement. But I wanted to use this, so I borrowed this uh, from my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Professor uh, Ababau. So on, at the top left corner, so that shows the trends of publications since the establishment of the medical school in Addis Ababa. So pre-1990, there were no many uh, psychiatric study reports. In fact, uh, 1964, when uh, the faculty was started, there was just one report that was, I believe, by Professor uh, Robert Keel, a Dutch psychiatrist who, started the Department of Psychiatry in Addis Ababa. So, but gradually things have improved. So the 1990, uh, mid 1990s, there were many master's uh, level uh, research, PhDs, psychiatrists also started to conduct research. That number has really improved significantly as you see in uh, 19, 2019. So the number has gone from nowhere to 400, uh, over 400 in five years time. I would say that was significant uh, change. In terms of the year and uh, collaborations, so Robert Keel is a, a bar, the middle bar with different uh, colors. So pre-1963, there was no big undertaking in terms of research. We had two psychiatric facilities. One was in current territoria, a small, but uh, well-functioning uh, psychiatric unit called St. Mary. There was another, uh, maybe a bigger uh, unit in Addis Ababa, the Emanuel Psychiatric Hospital. So the Department of Psychiatry started in 1964. Since then, 
there has been a lot of things that has taken place. Ethiopian psychiatrists have been coming into the picture year by year. I joined psychiatry uh, or the mental health uh, team in around 1995. By then, uh, collaboration with Umeå University in Sweden was started. Uh, then uh, the residency was started in 2003. There were uh, more and more people interested in uh, research. Uh, I remember uh, Greg, Professor Fritschoni, was first uh, in Addis to teach the residency in the residency program, maybe 2007, 2008. So that was not maybe indicated here. Then uh, the MGH and uh, BU, I think that collaboration started somewhere in 2010, but uh, maybe Dr. Borba also started earlier than that. So 2011 or so 12, maybe. So these were some of, so we have uh, acknowledged uh, the donors and collaborating institutions uh, here. The focus of uh, the researches in Ethiopia have been really a very uh, wide. There was a uh, interest to do epidemiological studies, but there were also many other uh, clinical interest, including drug uh, trials. Uh, that has really uh, developed into bigger collaborations, such as uh, the NeuroGAP study, where uh, different centers in Africa collaborated with the center in uh, uh, Massachusetts, in Boston. There are also more and more collaborations between different uh, parts, uh, different countries, which is a, a very good South to South uh, collaboration. So the interest has been really, uh, has developed over years and that has led to so many uh, publications that we saw over the last uh, few uh, years. I wanted to say just a few things about the Butajara study. The Butajara court, it was started with the goal of uh, looking into the course and outcome of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, mainly because there was a report that uh, the course and outcome of schizophrenia is better or more favorable in the developing countries or may, maybe a low income country. So we were, uh, wondering if that notion was real, if our patients had uh, that favorable uh, outcome. So we followed a uh, court so of uh, patients with diagnosis of schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder with psychotic uh, features, all sorts of bipolar uh, disorder and major depressive disorder, mainly with psychotic features for about, uh, I would say, 14 to 15 years, and we have published a lot uh, from that study. The findings in some ways were very, a uh, lot of people questioned where uh, we reported the prevalence of uh, nearly five to one, where uh, five men to uh, one uh, woman having diagnosis of schizophrenia, so that was really one of the biggest thing. That was what Dr. Borba tried to uh, explore further. But uh, that really laid a very good ground for many other studies in the country, including uh, the focus on the isolated uh, population such as the Borana pastoralists. Why did we focus on the isolated population? Well, many reasons. So these were, uh, People like uh, islanders who are lived in a certain island uh, who didn't mix with the people in the surrounding for hundreds of years, such as the Zoai or Zai islanders in the Borana pastoralist communities where there was no much alcohol or recreational drug use. 
So the Burana pastoralist community was, uh, is still the largest pastoralist community in Africa. Uh, the community is uh, a bit marginalized and the area is overall poorly developed, including you know, poorly developed infrastructure and access to services. I have to say things have changed over the last uh, two uh, decades. And uh, every time I go there, I see significant change in many uh, areas. And at the time, we were really wondering that, you know, there were no, or there were relatively low substance use other than most of the pastoralists, not necessarily most, but a lot of pastoralists, uh, uh, the people chew tobacco. Some smoke, but um, mostly chew. Uh, alcohol and cat use, cat is, uh, it's an evergreen uh, leaf. It's amphetamine-like substance people chew uh, for various uh, reasons. And uh, the effect is more or less, it's milder, but uh, it is, uh, a stimulant uh, as amphetamine-like uh, substance called uh, catin and catinone. But uh, there were very few people using this and uh, we thought it's a very good opportunity to study mental uh, uh, illness or men prevalence of uh, common mental illnesses and see how that goes. The method we used was a cross-sectional study. Uh, we cluster sampled uh, households and we used uh, a composite in an international diagnostic uh, interview, CD 2.1. And we also used uh, the World Health Organization scan scheduled for clinical assessment uh, for neuropsychiatric disorder. It's a huge over 300 page uh, semi-structured questionnaire. Uh, we really took uh, a lot of big decisions where we translated everything, validated as much as possible and used for uh, assessment. So the first part of this study was uh, published in uh, World Health Psychiatry uh, a Journal. And uh, we thought the finding was very much interesting. It is interesting mainly because uh, at the time we didn't find anybody suffering from a psychotic disorder. And we were a little bit excited that, wow, there is a community with uh, no psychotic uh, uh, illness. And then on the other hand also, we wanted to verify our findings. As I uh, stated above, tobacco use was maybe, uh, the highest prevalence, about 12% of people used uh, tobacco in one or uh, the other way. So they mostly chew uh, tobacco. So that is maybe about two thirds of uh, what is reported for substance use uh, disorder. So with that report, there was a lot of question and we also really wanted to look into what was uh, going on. We did another uh, study where we explored uh, the absence of uh, uh, psychosis. We published that again in the journal of uh, the World Health uh, Psychiatry in 2010. So this was where I was uh, involved uh, very, uh, I involved extensively uh, because I was very much interested in the key informant study. Key informant was one of the things I did uh, for my PhD and I was interested in understanding and uh, learning the people's understanding of mental illness. So how do they understand mental illness? What do you, what can we learn from them? Are there people whom they think are mentally ill? How do they understand them? What's the course of mental illness? What will happen to them? How do they treat them? So 
We recruited about 56 key informants. These are uh, people uh, you know, in the community, religious uh, leaders or uh, community uh, elders. Uh, we tried to match uh, age and uh, sex and about 46% uh, of the key informants were uh, uh, women. So we identified about 65 people through the key informant method. And then we did clinical assessment in addition to using the scan uh, to make a clinical diagnosis. And uh, we found out that uh, there were uh, quite a few <laughs> people with the diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia and psychotic uh, mood disorders and brief psychotic disorder. Some of these people, if I remember correctly, at least two of them were missed by the CD, which is a WHO uh, instrument. So while we did this, we had to walk through the villages. We, to, number one, we wanted to invite the key informants. We had to go from one, village to the next, from one to cool uh, to uh, the next. Uh, we also had to walk through the villages to arrange uh, meetings. It was also an opportunity uh, to look around if, as a way of uh, detecting a case if there is anybody staying on the streets, around the schools, around uh, the clinics, which were better uh, in buildings compared to the, the, what they could find in the villages. So as, they walked through, as we walked through the villages, we came across different schools. So we found the school to be a place to uh, learn during the day and also for most boys, a place to stay at night. So we started questioning about, so there were about 15 boys Age 10 to 15 in one school, in another school also, there were about 10 uh, young boys. And in both places, we didn't find any uh, girls. And we started to question about where are the girls? What will, are they not going to school? The reason why boys were staying in the school is their parents move away with cattle, with their livestock when it is a dry season then the girls have to go with their parents. They can't stay back. So we started, I started to think a little bit about what's going on. I thought of uh, something like, uh, you know, James uh, Agri, a Ghanaian. He's, he's known for, uh, many uh, stories and many uh, lectures and sayings, including like uh, fly, eagle, fly, or once eagle, always an uh, eagle. Uh, but uh, he's also known for this one, I think. So the surest way to keep people down is to educate the men and leave out the woman. And if you educate a man, you simply educate an individual. But if you educate a woman, you educate the whole nation. So I, I, I have the feeling that, wow, we're leaving really, leaving out a very important group of uh, as a society that has a potential to educate the whole nation. So we're only focusing on, but uh, there was nothing I could do. I thought about it a little bit and that was where I, uh, started. And we looked at uh, the, the problems with the girls. Definitely the pastoralist community, they move from one place to the next. Number one, it is, uh, the, that is their tradition. Number two, uh, it's due to an in increasing environmental factors. As you, we all uh, maybe have heard now, there is really severe drought in the northern part of uh, Kenya, southern Ethiopia, and um, uh, a lot of places in Somalia. So that is a very common 
thing and it is now happening more frequently than what it was over the last several uh, uh, decades. And people have to move from one area to the next and girls have to move with their uh, uh, parents. There is also perceived obstacle uh, to girls that participating in modern education is mainly for boys or for men. And uh, there is also attitude that, ah, girls education, but they don't go far. So it's better to invest in boys because the girls, you know, they will uh, get married. They will be out of school. They will have kids. They have to raise kids. So there is that negative sort of attitude. We did understand uh, the fact that uh, modern education is not really, it, it's a new thing, relatively new in Ethiopia. Like uh, the first state supported non-church based school was built in Addis Ababa only in 1908. It's called uh, the Menelik, the second uh, uh, school. It is still, it's uh, close by the main university science campus. But it doesn't mean that prior to that, Ethiopia didn't have any school. So there was a very good uh, church school. So the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is uh, well known for that. And uh, the church takes credit for running church-based school for generations prior to that. But it was not a modern school. It was uh, given mainly in Giz and Amharic alphabets, which is uh, uh, the, the Ethiopian uh, alphabet. Uh, it's used for uh, hymn books, uh, for churches, used for uh, church services, poetry, interpretation of uh, scriptures when they want to, uh, uh, for instance, read uh, a Bible and other spiritual uh, books. So it was not used widely elsewhere. I went to this old school when I was a kid. So when I was in grade six, around 1973, I think that was when it was. <laughs> so we were 16 and we had to sit, right, we had to write a national exam. 15 of us were uh, boys and there was only one girl and that was my older uh, sister. So we, I knew that girls were not given opportunity to uh, go to school, but I didn't know that uh, it goes to this extent where uh, there is no girl in a classroom, even uh, 20, 30 years after I, graduated maybe after I finished elementary school or moved on with my life. I thought things would have changed by then, but it didn't. So as we look back, even now, <clears throat> adult literacy rate is not very high. <clears throat> and uh, the number for uh, women is usually uh, far behind compared to uh, the men. So in 2004, uh, it was uh, reported as 22 or 23. Uh, in 2017, there is marked improvement, but it is still low, less than half. The government really has been uh, trying to use different systems. One of the system is a school expansion scheme. The school I showed here is uh, one of the new, newly built high school that I visited in September uh, a few months ago. It's built in the middle of nowhere. There were no people. There are no villages there because people have moved away uh, because of the drought. So the school was there. So that is the system the government uh, used. But uh, things have changed a little bit. Students. Uh, use the mother's uh, tongue uh, when they start school. And uh, the gross enrollment rate is also improving year by year. 
So having seen that, uh, I uh, really wanted to do something. I wanted to do what I could do. So I just went back home and shared uh, with my wife. We started uh, sponsoring a girl in 2004. Our goal was really to gradually expand it into a bigger program that would uh, provide educational material support for girls. At the same time, we, uh, at the same time, we wanted to run a summer uh, tutorial class, both for boys and uh, uh, girls. And we wanted also to support university students because they will be teaching in the uh, summer tutorial program. So we started we, in 2004 and were registered in 2005. We started providing educational material support for girls. We also simultaneously the next year started running a summer uh, class for both boys and girls where over uh, 40 university students who come home for the summer uh, involved as summer school teachers. Unfortunately, the, the last two, so the, it did, they didn't go very well because of uh, difficulty to manage, to supervise. Uh, so we, we stopped the last two uh, after about eight years. The last time we did that was uh, in 2012, but uh, we continued with the first uh, goal, uh, providing educational material support uh, for girls. As I said, we started with one girl in 2004. We really wanted to support her from grade 11. Uh, she did very well, she went to grade 12. We were excited. She went to university. We were more and more excited, and she graduated with a BSc degree in uh, health sciences. And she's she did her master's degree, and she's still working in one of the health centers in the region. So the next year, we plan to take four more girls. Where we wanted to increase the number of beneficiaries by five every year. We wanted to share the idea with some of our colleagues and uh, see how they would participate with us. But we're lucky we, we got a sponsor. Uh, we had a donation from uh, the Eritrea and Ethiopia Returnee Peace Corps volunteers. So, because we got a little bit of money, instead of moving from one to five, we jumped from one to 30 in September 2005. And since then, the number has been increasing from 30 to 60, then to 120, then to 143, which is the number we've been taking over the last uh, six, seven years, 143. 90% of the beneficiaries are uh, recruited into the program through the uh, competition. It is competition based because it's very difficult to recruit because everybody is needy. We can't say, oh, we, we take only the needy people because the demand is very high. So we can't really discriminate one from the other. So we wanted to recruit about 90% of the beneficiaries into the program through competition based looking into their grades. So the local board, including the, a member from the community, a member from the beneficiaries, uh, one of us, and then uh, a member from uh, district, district uh, school uh, bureau, so they look into the students uh, grade report and everything. So 90% goes to them. About 10% we give to you know, other girls uh, based on their needs. How do we know the needs? 
we, we, we just listen to the teachers, the teachers refer them to us, and then we, we accept at least 10% every year. What did we achieve so far? We had a total of uh, 1,853 beneficiaries so far. So the number has gone, as I said, from one to 30, then to 60, then 80, 120. Over the last six, seven years, we've been doing 143 uh, every year. Of those about 485 of them, they graduated from high school. They didn't have really a good grade to go to university. So they finished high school. That was one of our goal. So they stopped there. 102 of them graduated the yellow line. They graduated from university. I believe 98 or 99 of them are employed locally or within the region. It's only about two or three of them that were employed to our knowledge. So the rest have been successful and uh, working. We, this year for instance, we have 64 girls in the university or higher education system and uh, the rest of the girls go to high school. So, this program is, uh, as I said, supported through the Ethiopia and Eritrea Return Peace Corps volunteers. But uh, we do also uh, make our own uh, contributions. Uh, I do uh, regular supervision uh, virtually and then uh, at least uh, once uh, a year on-site uh, visits. We have uh, these days, oh, everybody has a cell phone, everybody uh, can answer calls from wherever. So we have mechanisms of uh, supervising if the beneficiaries are uh, making use of uh, the program. It, I would say the psychiatric research was a reason for us to start this foundation, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to see what was going on. So that's why I wanted to link the two uh, together, especially the Borana project where we didn't have any report of a psychotic uh, condition. So that was what led to the visit uh, in the villages. That is, I think briefly what I wanted to uh, present. These are uh, some of uh, the girls during my, uh, one of my supervisions. I thank you all and uh, I will now stop sharing the slide. I will be happy if 